Fire. Have a seat. So Jonathan you, comes from the OpenStack Foundation. <laughs> Probably many of you here know him. So Jonathan, start by telling us where you think OpenStack is today. So, um, you know, OpenStack uh, started in July of 2010, so, you know, a little over three and a half years ago. And um, I think that if, if I kind of look at the, the phases of OpenStack, the, uh, the, the first phase of it was really in 2010 and 2011, forming um, the community, reaching out to organizations outside of Rackspace and NASA, who are the two organizations that, that kind of kicked it off, getting involvement, getting development, getting a, a process for, for code to sort of move through the pipeline, and, uh, and really, um, you know, kind of setting up that, that piece of it. And then in 2012, we, uh, we, we actually created a, a nonprofit foundation um, because at this point, there was a lot of momentum, a lot of participants, and, uh, and it, it was clear that it should move outside of, um, of kind of being um, managed by Rackspace and into something that, was, that had a broad base of support and governance. And, uh, and you know, that was, I think, a lot of what went on in, in 2012. And that was when I would say we, we started to see the first, um, the first traces of, of adoption in a serious way in, in enterprises um, and, and different organizations. And like you said, you know, a lot of these are early adopters at the time. Um, companies like Intel, who, who's been building uh, an OpenStack environment out for um, two and a half years now and doing a lot of different workloads on it. Um, that's when they started. And, and as, as we uh, come into 2014, what I think uh, I, I see is we are at a point where we have a, an extremely strong base of, uh, of, of providers, of developers who are producing technology and, uh, and uh, a growing base of users. And I think that, that we're in a, in a really key spot now where it's time to get operators and cloud end users to, to really start to be more embedded into these processes that we put in place um, because, uh, as, as you say, you know, this is, this is the time when, when we start to transition from early adopters and, uh, and technology companies to a broader base of adoption. And there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of other requirements, a lot of other input that needs to come into it. So what do you think needs to be done to drive sort of past that initial early adoption? And how does that fit with what the foundation is doing in 2014? Yeah. So um, the... Uh, an interesting thing is if you look at, at some of the, uh, the, the biggest users that we have, um, a lot of them are, are um, you know, working with a vendor in some way, but also doing a lot of it themselves. And they'll, they, they tie in different components from, um, from the storage side or from the networking side, and then there are pieces that they go straight to the code base for. And I think that, uh, that over the long term, you know, broad-based adoption is going to happen in concert with, you know, with, with, um, with various other companies. Um, and, and those companies, you know, are, are taking the bits that make up OpenStack, which, um, you know, is, is, uh, is it's, there's a lot of technology there in a lot of different areas, and they're turning it into products. And I think that is a way that, uh, that traditional enterprises um, are used to consuming technology. Um, at the same time, I think that, uh, that one of the things that's, that's changing inside of enterprises is that software is becoming much more of a, of a core piece of people's business now than it, than it uh, ever has been before. And, um, you know, we have, a, we have an OpenStack user that's, that's a, they, they are not a technology company. They're a very large um, retail organization. And uh, they, what they sell has nothing to do with technology. But they have, they have stores all over the place and, uh, and they tie together all of their POC systems. They, they have um, large professional customers that they deal with on a regular basis. So they have advanced CRM systems, and their software is actually very important to them uh, in, in, in doing their business, much more so than it was five years ago. And so there are a lot of organizations where that's the case now, and so the infrastructure to enable their developers to, to iterate rapidly, to scale, to try out new functionality is, is more important to more organizations than ever before. So the, org the vendor organizations involved in OpenStack both cooperate and compete. Mm -hmm. Um, and as a result, we've had a lot of, for instance, different distributions, proprietary extensions to OpenStack, um, which ends up creating challenges for hybrid interoperability and really also the ability to switch between vendors. What is the foundation doing to address the needs of users to really understand what OpenStack is? Yeah. Yeah, this is a, a big focus in, in 2014. Um, there are, are a couple of initiatives that, uh, that we're spending a lot of our, our resources at the foundation on. And the foundation 
staff is, uh, you know, is, is very small. So our, our goal is really to, to basically coordinate activities within the community and uh, you know, get a lot, of, uh, a lot of things moving in a direction and getting people involved to, to help actually go, go carry that out. Um, but, but two of the key efforts that I would say are um, there's a, a process that's going on right now that, that's codenamed DEFCORE or you know, core definition. And, uh, and it's, it's kind of a series of steps that have been taken over the last year to get to a, uh, an, uh, an automated testing framework for interoperability for downstream um, products that, that come out of OpenStack. Uh, you know, you can take the OpenStack code and do a lot of different things with it. It's very, um, it's very broad technology. That's, you know, that's, that's part of what makes it so powerful, but it also can make it complicated. And you can end up in a, with, a, with an OpenStack cloud that looks one way and another OpenStack cloud that looks totally different. That's fine, you know, because people have different needs. But what we want to make sure is that it's clear where those differences are, which things are going to work in one area, which things are not going to work. And, uh, and so the, the, uh, the DEF Core um, uh, initiative is something that started up in November. And, uh, and by the summit in May, um, we're going to have uh, automated testing. We're going to have a way for, um, for publishing these tests so that, uh, that it's, it's easy for users to be able to go in and understand different solutions and you know, how they match up to, uh, to, to kind of a standard OpenStack installation where the differences are. And that's, that's, that's one initiative. Another thing that, that we're doing in 2014 is a series of, um, of, of different uh, um, uh, user engagement in events uh, to, to basically pull users more directly into the process. There's room for users right now in our process, but it's, it's open source. And uh, it can be intimidating to come jump into an open source community of 2,000 developers. You know? And so, um, so there are some, some smaller events that we're putting together with operators and users. And we're also um, doing, uh, doing some you know, just old fashioned relationship building between different users. We actually had a dinner last night with several users uh, here in the Bay Area. Um, you know, three companies that are, that are some of the biggest brands in the world, all using OpenStack and, uh, and doing it at, at you know, pretty large scale. And it, it, was, uh, it was interesting to see them get together. And within you know, 10 seconds of them sitting down at the table, they were just peppering each other with questions. Oh, well, you know, what do you do over here? And how, how did you uh, handle this? And what did you find out when you started using this project? And oh, are you looking at this? And, uh, and I think that, um, that, that there's an incredible power available out there uh, if, we can, if we can get those people talking, communicating, get them into the community. And, uh, and so we have a, a number of initiatives that we want to, uh, to, to spin up around both operators and cloud consumers, you know, end users who are building applications on top of, on top of OpenStack this year. How is the OpenStack roadmap built? And how does, that, how does basically user desires mm -hmm. factor into project priorities? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. The, Especially against the come with code. Stuff, <laughs> yeah. Right? Well, so the OpenStack um, roadmap is, is built through a six month release process. And, uh, and we are about midway through the current release cycle. And so the, um, the, with the six month cycle, we do a release and then we have an event. It's called our design summit. The next one is in May. And at that event, developers and users and people get together and talk about um, you know, what the priority is gonna be for the next release. And then they go off and they build it over the course of the next six months. Um, one of the things that we've heard, the, the, um, the, the technical leaders love getting that feedback but doing it at the summit, in a lot of cases, is too late to bring in a big change, a big requirement. And so, um, so we're actually creating mid-cycle meetups. And, uh, and some of these are focused just on users, um, where we are working with the user committee of the foundation to, uh, to come up with some prioritized lists um, two months ahead of time that we're going to feed to the technical leadership so that those discussions can happen ahead of time. And you, know, you mentioned come with code. Uh, it's definitely a code speaks kind of community. But um, you know, every, every technical leader in OpenStack that I have talked to or that has interacted with a user is really excited to get that feedback. Because that's why we build software, is for people to go out and, and use it. You know? And so, so what we at the foundation want to do is just facilitate those conversations at the right time in the cycle and, uh, and to be able to you know, have a good impact on, on the, the software. And so in terms of where OpenStack is going in this next year, um, what's going to be significant uh, across Icehouse and Juno? So I think that um, you know, there, are, there are a lot of, a lot of new programs and, and technology components that have spun up around OpenStack. 
and uh, and those you know often get a lot of coverage and a lot of excitement. Um, and you know you you have things like the orchestration system and the the metering and monitoring system that uh, that came in the last time around. And um, you know you have the the database as a service and all these kinds of things. And then there's a whole roadmap of other things that that are out there. But I think that what is uh, what's really valuable that's happening right now is these users who are getting involved. Um, we had, I think, over a dozen um, pretty major users that were code contributors in the last release. And, and what they are doing is they are driving it towards maturity and towards being much more operable, um, towards being upgradable, you know, these kinds of things. And I think that that, to your, you know, to your points earlier, those are the kinds of things that, uh, that, that bridge that divide between early adopters and kind of mass adoption. And in that context, as you look at OpenStack's future, um, and you look at innovation in OpenStack, to what degree do you expect that innovation is going to be driven by OpenStack versus OpenStack seeking to essentially commoditize innovations from the rest of the, of the ecosystem, whether it's Amazon or Google or Microsoft's innovations, let's say? Mm -hmm. um, it's, that's an interesting question. You know, I, I think that if I think back to where we started, it was, uh, it was much more about um, trying to come up with a, a strong, viable um, option for, for some of the technology ideas that were, that were already out there. Um, but what, what we've seen as this community has grown is it's actually drawn in a lot of very strong technical talent from around the world in a lot of different subject areas. And more and more, um, you know, there are things that are, that are being done in OpenStack that then get pulled into, into other, um, in some cases, you know, into other proprietary companies, into other open source projects. And it's not just on the cloud side. One of the things that, that I think is really interesting that, that's happened is it's one of the, the largest and fastest growing open source projects ever. And, uh, and we get tens of thousands of contributions. And in order to be able to handle that at, at the kind of scale that we're, we're, you know, we're at with a distributed system like this, there is a lot, of, uh, a lot of testing that we have to do and a lot of complicated dependencies in this testing. And so um, you know, we've built an open source system for managing that. And it sound, that sounds kind of like, OK, that's interesting, but not really related to cloud. But it, it, it's actually something that, uh, that has, has been implemented inside of, um, inside of proprietary software development companies, inside of other open source projects, major ones. Uh, because uh, you know, what, what really has happened is, is it's created this kind of center of gravity for, for people who want to work on hard distributed problems. And so I, I, you know, I, I think that a couple of years ago, I would not necessarily have seen it as, as like the, the hotbed of innovation. But I think that, uh, that it just shows you the power of, of, of a community. It's becoming more and more of that. So I think looking out to the future, um, I think that, uh, that it'll continue to be a combination. But uh, I think we'll, see, we'll definitely see some, uh, some strong innovations coming out. Good. Thank you. They put Ken. Okay. You want to come up? Yeah, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. 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 So, Ken, you work for Selenia, which is a professional services company for OpenStack. What drives uh, adopters to look at OpenStack professional services? Well, so you know, I think we see a wide array of adoption out there. And I think different segments of the population come for different reasons. If you're a service provider, you're really coming probably for integration. You've probably rolled your own because you need some differentiation in your service, so you need source code control. But you do need to integrate it into things you already have there. You've got a billing system. You've got some kind of, of operational system and things like that. And, and so it's really around the technical bits of integration and things. A lot of our work, though, is actually in the enterprise. And the enterprise comes at a much different entry point. They really come in at what we call a strategy point. And most of the time when we get involved with clients, in the enterprise at least, their first thought is, do I need a cloud? Or how would I actually take advantage of cloud? And it's not about OpenStack. It's not about private or public clouds. It's, should I be using cloud? And if so, how would I get onto that? And there's certainly technical elements to it. But actually, a lot of it's around process and governance, is if I were going to use a private cloud or a public cloud, how would I make sure that I still have governance of who's running um, particular jobs? How do I know where my data is? How do I know my data is safe? And those kind of things. 
And so it really depends on what kind of uh, situation you're coming from of why people come to you know, someone who's actually going to help them with consulting. Mm -hmm. So you get involved initially strategically. So you get, in, you get involved in the deployment side as well? Absolutely. So you know, I think it's really difficult to have just someone come in and do generic cloud strategy for you because it's really easy to get disconnected from the realities of how hard it is to actually deploy this, whether you're moving to a public cloud or you know, actually implementing a private cloud. And you know, the answer tends to be is you're going to do both. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is a lot of technical issues in there. And it's really difficult to just have someone come in and do a strategy and kind of walk away from it and think that magically someone's going to be able to pick that up and actually make that happen for you. So we do a lot of both architecture and integration. And what we've really found is, as challenging as things can be on the technical side around implementing, which is fairly well known, um, most of the people actually have the problems on the operations side. It's, I built it, I don't know how to get my actual business divisions to put their apps onto it. They don't know how to write for it, they don't know how to migrate to it. My operational people are used to having being you know, effectively level zero support people and being able to go to a backline vendor, which you know, a lot of them aren't, don't have a vendor right now to do that to. Uh, and simply, you know, a lot of the tools that are out there that they're used to don't exist in the open stack, and not just in open stack. You can go to cloud stack or vCloud and have the same problem. Operating clouds are difficult. Mm -hmm. So what do people typically find to be most difficult when initially deploying open stack? You know, so I think there's two parts that are, are difficult for them. One is simply the scoping and overall project management of it. I think a lot of them have a wild idea of what they've seen Amazon Web Services be able to do and think they're going to be able to replicate eight years of 500 engineers at Amazon in their data center in three weeks. And so there's a, a scope problem and an overall goaling problem. And then there's technical issues. And, you know, there's technical issues with any cloud out there. And I'll be honest with you, most of them probably boil down to networking. Um, I think networking is probably the most difficult part for anyone. And it's also the part where you have to have the most legacy integration in. It's pretty easy to go out and buy all new virtualization pieces, buy all new storage. Um, but at the end of the day, you're probably going to have to integrate into the corporate network in some way. And that's where a lot of problems tend to happen also. It's also probably the least mature piece of OpenStack or any of the pieces out there. Probably also with the highest potential, though, to really change how enterprises do things. And so for an average organization, not necessarily an organization that's incredibly technically savvy, how long does it take to basically do that kind of knowledge transfer where you can leave and you know, the organization is able to take over comfortably installing, upgrading, maintaining that OpenStack-based cloud themselves? So I think it's depending on how much they're willing to actually change their organization um, and how much they actually need to change it. You talked earlier about some people actually wanting to take their initial landscape that they already have and then move actual workloads into the new cloud mm -hmm. versus people who start up and do a net new. Mm -hmm. um, we really don't see a lot of people today taking that landscape that they have. Most of them are kind of boxing that landscape and saying, let's put new apps out here on the new cloud, especially if the workload's fit for it. For those, if they're willing to come out and create a new organization, make some organizational changes, and perhaps break down some of the walls that they've seen between network, virtualization, servers, data center, and storage people, start getting them to talk together either in a, a specific organization or, quite truthfully, hire in for that. It can be anywhere as short as a month or two. Other places, we've talked to them for, you know, years. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's much more of a change management process than it is simply a technology transfer. As you look at where OpenStack is going over the next couple of releases, do you think that professional services are going to become more important in the ecosystem? Or do you think that more users are going to find it easy to, to be able to do all the implementation they need without the use of professional services? So I, I think what you'll find is it depends what professional services you're talking to. So if you talk about a life cycle where you start with strategy, you move into an architecture, you actually deploy it, and then you start talking about adopting where you're actually putting workloads on it and managing it. Mm -hmm. I think where you're going to find is you have value at each end, and in the middle, you're going to see a valley of death. If you're just out there to implement, 
as a professional services organization, that is going to get easier. Every single vendor out there is writing an installer and in trying to get to that magical MySQL five minute install. <laughs> We're not there yet, um, but over time that's gonna be easier and easier and it's gonna be less and less value. On the other hand, the strategy and the adoption of it, being able to actually drive monetary value on this side and being able to make sure that you have the right scope and strategic objectives on this side, I think those will become more and more valuable. Mm -hmm. And especially as it becomes more complex where hybrid clouds become a reality, you know, I think either end of that becomes much more valuable. And as customers go through trying to decide what are the components that go into the solution, what are the critical decision points uh, you think they're, may, they're having to decide on, whether it's server, server architecture, storage architecture, other tools? Uh, so I think they have a lot of different decisions there, and it's not just they can, I think a lot of people would like to take those decisions in, in silos. What's the best servers? And I get this a lot. What are the best servers? Give me two servers that I can go to, you know. Can I go do Quanta uh, or Wistrom or, or can I put it on Dell? Um, and, and they want to silo those decisions because that's how they've made decisions before. It's a classic purchasing decision. The problem is, is OpenStack's a framework and it is a solution. Everything needs to work together. And today, and I, I think not only today, but in the future, not every solution, you cannot pick one thing from everything and just magically make everything work. Um, there are solutions that work together. And there are solutions that don't really work together. You can't make your decisions in isolation. You need to make a holistic decision, both on the technology side, but also on how you're actually going to aim for workloads. I think a lot of people think, well, this is the new virtualization. I will go ahead and take any virtualization workload I had before and put it on there. Yeah, some of those may work, um, but you may not be driving the most value out of that. You really need to look at what cloud is gonna drive the most value for you and think about then, how do I design my cloud for that? And then how do I actually move workloads onto it? For your typical customer, what constitutes success with OpenStack? So most of our customers, we try to start small for them with a proof of concept or a pilot, like, Pretty much everyone does. And usually we go in, in in the strategy area and highlight specific workloads that we can drive specific value from. And most of the time those are new workloads. And increasingly we found that the big data and analytics are the things that actually make your TCO or your, your actual you know, benefits really drive the, the economics for that cloud. And so we'll come in and help them with driving those, those KPIs that they need um, to figure out what that would be. A lot of times there's gonna be a cost component in it, definitely. But for a lot of the people that I'm looking at, they're actually getting into new things they've not been able to do before. So I've got a, a top five automotive, automotive company. Uh, not typically a person you probably see as an early adopter. They have a huge amount of data out there that right now, in general, they tend to use in Microsoft Excel on people's spreadsheets. Um, and it takes everything from telematics data to warranty data uh, to data actually in sensors on racetracks when they go out and test these cars. And now they're able to actually centralize all of that from all of their different areas. And even with people out driving in the field, they're able to do things they haven't been able to do before. So it's not just an economic. They're actually breaking in and doing new things with it, which, you know, in general, is hard to, to express sometimes in economic terms. In about five minutes, I'm going to take questions from the audience. So if you've got questions, begin thinking about them. Um, a question for both of you. Um, what do you think is going to be most important to broaden the appeal of OpenStack beyond early adopters? So I'll answer that. Um, so I think today, a lot of people look for OpenStack and are looking for a product, more of a product as they have imagined it before. And I think today you see kind of products on two ends from the vendors. Uh, one is I've taken the bits and really just packaged them and I'm gonna give you support behind it, but really nothing more than that. It's a pretty light packaging and it's probably thrown into your distro. Uh, on the other end, you have a very tightly cast uh, solution all the way down to telling you what hardware it is. I think people want something in between there, which is they want all of the pretty installers, the great looking GUIs, um, they want some management tools around it, things that you would normally see in perhaps like an ERP system. Um, they want to be able to see the ecosystem that's there. They want a true product. And I think what we're going to start seeing, and we already see that with some of the large vendors today, 
we're starting to converge towards that middle. And I think towards the end of this year or early next year, we're going to start seeing that. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, the only thing that's really, in my opinion, has cut cloud stack in any of the discussions today. I mean, let's face it, they've got a great looking GUI. Um, past that, things kind of fall apart on you, but they've got a great looking GUI. I think as we start getting that polish on some of the areas, and especially in the products that are supported, I think that's going to start disappearing. I think, I think that that's, I, you know, I'm not going to disagree with anything Ken said there. I think that one other thing that, that you actually touched on, um, I, was, uh, I was actually at a Gardner conference in December. <laughs> Um, and uh, and I was uh, you know talking with different people and they they were talking about OpenStack and their plans for it and then um, and then you know one of these guys I was talking to is that he's at a very large um, enterprise and and uh, and he said you know I want to do I want to do OpenStack um, you know who do I hire like I, like how do I build out that team. And, and he's like, you know, this, this cloud thing is very different from how we've run technology before. Can you, I don't, it's not like I need you to point me to an individual. Tell me, like, what job I hire for. And I, so I think that that's still one of the things you mentioned earlier, you know, in, in your introduction, that we're on the front edge of private cloud adoption. And, uh, and there are companies out there who, who have a, a business need that's driving them there faster. And it's not, I don't think it's just broken down by technology or non-technology company. It's, it's really opportunity-based. But as these other companies come along, they're having to, to kind of, um, and sometimes it's a much more, uh, it's much more trouble on the organizational front than the technology front for them. And so I think that's part of, of it as well, is just um, coming up with patterns about how you build out a cloud ops team, how you structure your organization to provide technology services rather than servers for technology. And, and some of those kinds of things are, I think, the, the key um, pieces on the organizational side that, uh, that, that you know, hold back adoption of OpenStack and cloud in general. So what is the skill set of the ideal sort of OpenStack administrator or OpenStack champion in an organization? Yeah, it's all over the map. It's, this is, it's really interesting because we've, um, one of the things that, uh, that we started last year was, uh, was a training program um, within the foundation to, to help aggregate training around the world. And we have, you can go to openstack.org slash training and find um, courses in something like 40 or 50 different cities around the world. There's a lot of training out there that's available. And, uh, um, and as we go through that process and talk to people, they come from all sorts of, of different uh, parts of the organization. In some cases, they're developers who couldn't use a public cloud. Um, you know, they, they, for whatever business requirements, but they want that flexibility. In some cases, it's a, uh, it's, you know, a DevOps kind of organization anyway, and so it makes sense for them to move this direction. And in some cases, it's, it's coming from the architecture and engineering staff that's running the infrastructure right now, and they're getting a lot of inbound demand for this kind of, of functionality. So it, it really depends on, on how it's, if it's kind of being pushed as an organizational thing or if it's a pull from, from different uh, uh, consumers within, within the organization. Um, and I think that it, it just, again, that speaks to kind of the early stage of it all. There's not a, I would say that, the, that I haven't seen one standard process for how OpenStack finds its way into, uh, into an org. So what skills do, does someone need to administer OpenStack yeah. well, at you know, this stage in its maturity? Yeah, it's the, uh, the organizations that I, that I would say have been most successful have, um, have strong systems engineers and, uh, and who are um, you know, very comfortable in kind of looking at the, at the internals of, of what they're running. Um, you know, I think as, as Ken said, there, there are a number of products that are coming online now that are everything from, you know, distributions of the software to appliances, and, uh, and those, you know, smooth out some of those rough edges and make it something that's, that's more consumable. Um, and I think that's, like, that's, we're just getting to that stage where a, uh, a, a, an administrator can operate an environment like this given the right, given the right configuration. Yeah. I think the other thing that you see out there is you need a network department that actually yeah. understands applications. And you know, that can be the, either the biggest roadblock you have or your biggest benefit as you're putting this in. If the network people really understand applications and enabling applications, they can really smooth all of this over for you. And so I think that's a key part. And then on the adoption side, I mean, it's enough to put it in and operate it, 
but you, eventually your application people need to be able to write applications for it. And being able to go into that side of the organization also and make sure that they understand how they might be able to use this either in a test dev or a production way. We spend a lot of time over there also to make sure that they actually monetize this later. Okay. Questions from the audience? For a new customer. So the question there was, what are the use cases that you're seeing out there? And then what are uh, our favorite use cases that are out there? So you know, I see two of them that come up consistently. And you know, this depends on who's actually championing it within the organization for you. Um, but consistently, you will see analytics or big data. You will see some kind of mobility, uh, whether it's mobile phones or cars or, or something like that and the, the ability to actually project applications for them. So those two come up fairly consistently, and especially if you have a CTO or a chief innovation officer who's leading the charge, that tends to be that new application there. However, there are other places, especially if you're a SaaS provider today, it's their SaaS application, and they're wanting to, in general, repatriate some amount of their real estate back from AWS or someone else and bring that in-house for them. And so those are kind of the top three that I see out there today. Um, I love the, the big data one myself. Um, it drives a lot of the real key, I think, benefits of having cloud. Um, it's also just one of my interests um, because it hits all of the areas there and kind of stresses any cloud that you have and actually lets you use some of the, the really interesting features of OpenStack that are out there. Um, but you know, other people will have their, their preferences also. Um, you know, the, it's, I think that, that a lot of it is applications that, that, uh, that, that run well in a, um, you know, in, in kind of a traditional three-tier application architecture. That's what a lot of people are, are deploying. Uh, in terms of things that I think are interesting, I, I actually have found it interesting um, to see some of the, they're, you know, they're sort of sassy, but it's, it's, the, it's the applications behind appliances, like the Comcast Xfinity, um, use case, um, or the you know the Sony PlayStation use case, where the thing on the other end is not someone in a browser or someone sitting at a you know at a computer. They're using something that that you you know it, it actually puts a lot of a lot of load on infrastructure somewhere back behind the scenes. You know that's you know it's powered by OpenStack, um, but you would never think of OpenStack as being a component of that. And I think those are always interesting. Yeah, and I think that leads to where you might see the next wave of big applications. The Internet of Things, yep, yeah. uh, you know, where it's a thousand Nest thermometer or thermostats that are out there. I think that might be the thing that drives that kind of next wave that you see. Stand up if you've got a question and someone will come to you with a mic. Stay standing if you've got a question, actually. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, for net new applications, um, what are the reasons that you're seeing enterprises choose OpenStack over a public cloud like Amazon or uh, GCE? Is it, is it uh, you know, fear of losing the jobs, or is it regulatory compliance reasons, or it, cost, or what do, you, what do you see? Yeah, I mean, so for most people today where I've seen them, especially in big data, um, move to a private cloud is, A, simply they know their security stance will not allow them to do that, whether it's regulatory or compliance, or it's simply that, that data is, is too, uh, uh, too proprietary for them. However, there are a large number of people that probably don't have those rules, but they don't actually have the governance in place to know if that data is actually proprietary or not. So I have uh, more than a few clients where they just haven't gone through and looked and said, this is proprietary data and I can only use it in-house versus this is data that could go out-house. Sorry, outside of house. <laughs> um, and they really haven't gone through that exercise yet. They don't have the, the corporate rules around governance of what I can do outside or inside. They may be in a semi-regulated place where they have some customer proprietary data and they don't want to co-mingle it, for example. Uh, but we see a host of different reasons that people do that. And most of them will default is, if I don't clearly know that I can do it, I, I probably will do it inside. You also see the point of, because it's a batch, um, it's a fairly constant load, and because it's a constant load, you know, you kind of, you know, let's own the base and rent the peak, 
And so they'll go ahead and, and own the base there. Someone somewhere right now is, uh, is actually setting up a StackForge project for OpenStack <laughs> Outhouse. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, another question. Yeah, as uh, OpenStack becomes more mainstream, how do you see people backing up OpenStack-based solutions? Uh, is there a more focused project in OpenStack like that's going to focus on backup recovery? Or what, what do you see people doing there? Yeah, so I'll be honest, I have not seen anyone, I, I haven't seen any commonality in how they're doing either backup or disaster recovery around those infrastructures. Um, I think we're starting to see some interesting products uh, that people are working on. Uh, I, I've heard about fault tolerant versions of these uh, of coming out. Um, I think there's a lot of people looking at archiving solutions and such. But for that infrastructure itself, you know, I think we're waiting for, that's hopefully a feature of products uh, that are coming to market that will have a backup. Today, almost all of that is, is some kind of bespoke thing that we integrate um, for that particular client. Um, and, you know, depending on how large the cloud is, it may be something where we're backing up one cloud to the other, one site to another. Um, it might be one where we're taking and backing up um, particular parts of it into their legacy landscape. Um, but today, I haven't seen any commonality or best practice probably there. Another question? Yeah, right here, this side, to your, to your right. Uh, is there any use case that just could not be done any other way? I'm looking for sort of indisputable advantages of OpenStack. <laughs> <laughs> so, in, in general, I wouldn't say could not be done any other way but could not be done economically any other way, a lot of the big data fits into that. I mean, we go, I come into a lot of, of the engagements thinking that it's gonna be an application, and like when I went to our, our automobile uh, client, I, I was sure it was we were gonna be projecting interesting apps to the dashboard, and cool, like we were doing maps and all these things, but when you went down to you know, the numbers and what was gonna prove the TCO for that cloud, it was, wow, we've got a lot of data and putting that in a public cloud or in a legacy, what they, was a Teradata, um, it was a no-brainer to go to cloud for that. And it was, didn't even have to have a conversation about it. Um, so in general, you know, I hate to keep harping on it, but it tends to be that data element. Well, it's computer science, so there are always an infinite number of ways to do everything. <laughs> uh, but I, th I think that, that, you know, the, the, that you know, we have some other users that are going to be speaking today, and it's a good question for them for, you know, I think, um, you know, the points that, that led them to this. I, the thing that I think I've heard over and over and over again is, is it's about allowing them to move more quickly. And, uh, and, you know, yes, there are other ways to accomplish agility inside of IT, but, uh, but you know, OpenStack lets them do it in a way that is flexible on the deployment side, that lets them work with technology or vendors that they already know, lets them customize it to their needs, it lets them put it in-house in their security posture, and, uh, and when you add up all of those things, uh, then it just makes sense for, for these people to, you know, to, to go this path. And so how do users adapt their security and regulatory compliance needs for OpenStack? It's that that's another one of those things that is that it, it's different for for you know a lot of uh, a lot of the different use cases. The the biggest piece of it in in many cases is just being able to to get it inside of inside of their environment inside of their network. Um, you know that's that's kind of step one, and then after that it's uh, it's it depends on what the how strict those requirements are and the kinds of things that they need to do. But you know, it's it's tying it into their existing intrusion detection systems, and you know, some of this was was uh, um, the some of the key drivers behind Neutron in the beginning, uh, were, were to set up a, a a framework for being able to to have a more richly um, manageable network topology inside of your uh, inside of your virtualized environment, and uh, and then you know, other pieces of it tie in. There's always you know layers with security, and you can go down to the to um, extensions in the processor to verify the hardware and what's on this hardware. So it really varies all over the map. The interesting thing is that you know you can go to a lot of the, the different vendors that work inside of OpenStack, and they have they expose those things through um, through OpenStack, so you can take advantage of it where you need it. Yeah, 
I think I've seen a similar thing. OpenStack actually is very rich in the points of governance it provides you. Um, not all the tools are great. I mean, you, yeah. you're in JSON for some things, and perhaps it's not a nice GUI for it. But it does provide the points of governance, both in Keystone as well as in your, your service catalog within Glance and different areas to actually provide the similar points of governance that you may have in your legacy. It's really about, though, talking about how you're going to redo governance and move from a deny everything, yeah. come to me, come to a person for an exception to go do something, to a whitelist approach where this person has the ability to do these things. If you go outside of that, then you perhaps need some kind of human intervention. And we've had this problem you know, other places where we had a client, for example, here in the States, a financial company. It took them somewhere around 85 to 95 days to put a new server on the floor. They went to virtualization, and that was 75 days to put a new <laughs> VM on the floor. And they went to cloud, and it was only 73 days to put a new <laughs> cloud instance there. So obviously, that's not a technology problem. <laughs> that is a process problem. And that's a lot of what this governance and, and security is really about. And it's being able to have the discussions about how do I do this in a, ra a sane and rational way um, without exposing, hopefully, too much risk to the corporation. Yeah, Ken, I wonder if you could comment on uh, your third use case, the, the, the repatriation of, um, of public cloud applications. Kind of what's the dynamics involved there, the business cases, and, and how did those work out? So I've heard, depending on which SaaS provider you're at, but almost everyone that I've talked to, they have a number for Amazon where they believe that they get above that number of a, a dollar spend at Amazon, that they believe they're getting diminishing returns on their service. And everyone has that number, and I've heard wildly different numbers about what it is, but everyone knows what that number is, it appears today. And when they start getting towards that number, they're looking about how can I move my steady state parts of my application back onto premises and be able to do, you know, be able to service that locally, well then I actually just rent the spike or, or the peak out there. Now having said that, that doesn't mean that, you know, there's magic around creating a hybrid cloud that automatically auto bursts in AWS and things. I think though everyone's looking at that today about how can I actually do that? How can I partition or architect my application to be able to do that? Where it might be something as simple as, you know, I'll do batch on premise at night um, or during the day on site because that's a fairly relatively constant workload. And I, by the way, I have my data there. And then I'll just run the online part, which happens to be much more spiky, um, and rent that part. Um, but I think it's an evolving one right now. It's just one that I'm seeing. I, I can't necessarily say I have the perfect answer because I think it's going to be very, um, it'll be very different depending on your application. Thanks, okay. you both. We've got uh, one more question on the left-hand side or speaker's right. So a, a lot of what's been talked about is uh, organizational adoption of OpenStack for private clouds. Can you give us a, a little bit of a, a view of uh, OpenStack-based public cloud platforms apart from Rackspace and who's moving up and uh, what are some of the choices out there today that are commercially available? So, um, yeah, the public clouds that are running on OpenStack, you know, Rackspace is, is obviously one that the people know about. Um, HP Cloud, they're here today. <laughs> and I think um, Bill is going to be yep. speaking later. So InterNAP uh, is also here today. Yeah, and InterNAP is, is here today as well. Um, you know, there are a number of other, other companies out there in the, in the hosting and, and cloud space, um, like Bluehost and Dreamhost and um, uh, Innovance and CloudWatt over in France. Um, there are uh, uh, companies in, in Asia and, and all over the world. Um, the, this is actually getting back to some of the points we were talking about earlier. It's a, it's a common question, and so one of the things that we want to do this year in the foundation is really organize and aggregate the, the, uh, the different pieces of, uh, of the OpenStack ecosystem in a way where if you're looking for an appliance, if you're looking for a public cloud, you're able to, to go um, navigate that more easily and, uh, and you know, answer that question very clearly by region, by capability, again, with um, the DEF core process and the interoperability, you're able to tell my application needs this set of APIs, they support them. So there are, there are a lot out there, but it can be kind of hard to find that, and I think that's one of the things that we want to fix this year. Thanks. All right, thank you.
Great. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to bring up our next panel.